What are steps that people can take today to get these tool sets to ask better questions? Right. I mean, there's quite a few resources out there available. I can't just pimp my own, my own material. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of critical thinking websites and challenges online that people can find. Um, there are shows they can listen to because just by listening to shows and opening your mind and broadening your mind, you kind of through osmosis start to pick up those skills, right? Because you, you know, especially if somebody calls somebody out on bullshit, you know why, you know, you know that they've violated some rule of logic or they've committed some fallacy of reason somewhere. They might not give, always give a, a name to the face kind of thing, but they will be able to get it intuitively. And then if they want to more formally structure their reasoning skills, they can go on and they can find, you know, all kinds of stuff. But again, I'm obviously biased. I've taken these skills and kind of distilled them to try to make it as easy as possible for people, uh, not only to read and remember, but to apply. So, um, yeah. Can, can we actually dissect the A, B, C, yeah, D, sure. E, Fs? I sure. thought that was Please, really interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I took what I think are the six most foundational skills uh, or tools of the critical thinking skill set, and they just follow the you know, the mnemonic of A to F. So A is for argument. So right off the bat, we talk about what is an argument. And part of the problem with critical thinking that I'm mentioning in this, the next book that's coming out in May is that the, the very term critical thinking can scare people because they almost immediately think you're going to criticize me. You're going to find something wrong with me. Oh. And they get their hackles up about it. And it's almost anxiety imp invoking to say critical thinking. But I can't call it. I've tried. If you guys can come up with a sweeter, better, more precise term. Constructive feedback. Constructive thinking. <laughs> right. But you are critiquing ideas. Yeah. You're, you know, and people need to know that critical is constructive too. Yeah. yeah. As well as destructive. And there's nothing wrong with destructive criticism. If your uh, ideas suck, we need to call you out on that. And we need the tools. The term argument. What does it bring to mind, right? Mommy and daddy are arguing. But the, oh, that couple over there, they're arguing. And arguing has a negative connotation to it. In critical thinking, argument is a really good thing. In fact, it's the best way in which you can put your ideas together so that people can best understand why it is you believe what you do. They might not have to agree with you, but you make it very clear to them when you put your ideas in the form of an argument. And so that's why I use the... The analogy the of a house. So your roof is your conclusion and you want your conclusion supported by really strong walls, which are your premises. And those premises have to satisfy the foundational criteria of things like consistency and simplicity and relevance and reliability and sufficiency. And if they do, then you have a fairly sound structure. You have a fairly sound argument. And if you don't, and one of those walls is weakened, your premises are not very well researched or you didn't get it from a reliable source, and that wall comes down and maybe so does your roof come down as well. So that anal analogy, I think, plays fairly universally around the world for teaching people that arguments are good things and put your ideas into that structure and do the same with others. If you don't quite understand what another person is saying, try to imagine and get them. What is your overall point? You know, you force them. And then Fairness is the cornerstone of critical thinking. We have an obligation to the other person with whom we disagree to try to represent their argument back to them in the best possible light. Don't be coy. Don't be slimy. Don't try to misconstrue it or create a straw man out of it. Steel man it. We're using this term now, steel manning an argument. It shows intellectual maturity for me to be able to tell you what your argument is so that you go, yeah, yeah, in fact... You even put some stuff in there I didn't even think of. It's funny yeah, you this bring is that what... up. Like uh, Chris Voss, he's a B-O-S-S. -S. He has a great book called Never, Sp uh, Never Split the Difference. Ah, okay. And he's an F he was an FBI uh, interrogator working for negotiations. Right, right, right. And he has a chapter in the book called That's Right. And one of his best strategies is he, he wants to reiterate the person's belief system better than he or she can do it to a point to yeah. say, that's right. Yeah. But this is this is what I dislike about most arguments and especially with politicians. You know, you, you you see this in the social media space. Somebody says a sentence, somebody picks that one point, and instead of understanding the whole point, now we're going down this rabbit uh, rabbit hole of 
like insignificance because somebody is paying attention to a point instead of understanding the whole picture and That's right. the, the whole perspective of what that person's saying. And the and sooner we often, realize that fairness really is, and the, nobody wins. is the cornerstone and it, it yeah. go, it's got to go both ways. It's about civility as well, right? We've lost touch with that. We've lost that capacity to be civilized towards one another in disagreement. It's easy to get along when we agree, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's having a good time. Everybody agrees. Once you get disagreement though, you know, and this is what C.S. Lewis called the art of disagreement. We have to relearn that. I'm afraid we're going to have to reteach that to students. That it's okay. We're always going to disagree. We're never always going to be 100% on board yeah. of every detail of every aspect of but life. But I think, I think social media and internet has a role to play because funny thing is I, I was watching like old debates between Milton Friedman. I was just about to say Milton that. Oh. The 70s and 60s and 80s. Yeah. yeah, Bob, I'm just looking how the, yeah, how the students behave and asking really articulate questions. That's right. And I'm like, fuck, world of a difference now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Well, now yeah. everyone's shouting at each yeah. other. William F. Buckley, those guys, they, they really knew how to have dialogue and disagree without being reduced to an ad hominem, without, you know, calling the other person names or whatever. Yeah. Look at Trump. Look at all the names he had for people. Yeah. Like, he immediately goes to the ad hominem, right? Because I guess in his business mind or whatever, that's how you get the, gain the upper hand or whatever, right? You, you demean the other person or yeah. have some kind of power struggle. I really enjoyed the exercises in the book, uh, How to Be a Really Good Pain in the Ass. Mm -hmm. Was it good or great? How to become a really good. Good, pain in the ass. So basically, um, it was a script, mm -hmm. somebody having a discussion, and then using the tools, we would break it down and say, well, where is the conclusion, the thesis? What's the roof? What's the supporting? And what, what's, the, uh, what's the foundation here? Right. And something as simple as that can be replicated in schools. And I thought that was really interesting. I wish this kind of stuff was done more uh, to help people understand. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I did take it into the school system in 2016, 2017. I was granted the right with the Minister of Education at that time, Liz Sandals for Ontario, to go into some high schools for a pilot project. Mm -hmm. And it went extremely well. But at that time, the Ministry of Education was dealing with yet another strike with teachers and staff. I don't know if you remember that. But after it was settled, I mean, she was very honest with me. She said, if I come down now after we've settled all this and I heavy handedly say, you have to now teach critical thinking, that'll be one more point for them to, of resistance, right? To say, really, we just got all this settled and now you want us to do X. She said, it's far better to come up from the ground, from the school boards up, get it into the school boards, get them using it. And then that'll influence other school boards. So I've been trying to do that for years now, but it's kind of a, <clears throat> an uphill battle. It, it's know? wild to me that that is not one of the most important classes to be taught in schools, how to think, mm -hmm. uh, how to project manage, how to think, how to learn. These are some of the basics. I know. You know it, it surprises me even um, at the university and college level where I see our interns or young people who are working with us that are still going to school part-time doing these assignments. There is no structure for them to understand. The ones that have, are working with us or have gone, come through uh, an internship, they understand how, how to PM, how to organize people, how to, how to divvy up the work, how to do something like simple as like you know cards and scrum. None of this stuff is taught at school, but yet you're given uh, an assignment and you have a month to do it or two months to do it. And if that young person doesn't have the family structure or the connections to understand, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what? I saw my, my parents know how to do a project and this falls into place. This is a project. How the hell are they supposed to know? This is why, like, kids do worse in school than they could. They could potentially be doing so much more if they oh. learn things like critical thinking, things like how to project manage a project. Yeah, we assume students know how to think, that they come ready-made. They don't. There are rules. There are rules for thinking. And when you violate them, we can... We can call you out on those and we should be called out as well. So yeah, argument first, A is for argument, then B, bias. B is for bias. You bias, have yeah. to understand that no human is without bias. So understand, do what I call the mirror test. Start figuring out what are the, you know, the, the, the natural and the cultural biases that have led to your believing what you now do about a particular issue. And what if you were born somewhere out somewhere else in the world, or even at a different time, do you think you would still have that same belief? You know, because it's almost, you know, impossible that you wouldn't. I mean, 
you are a, a largely a product of your surroundings and how you were mm -hmm. raised. Mm -hmm. And if some of those beliefs come from very fundamentalist ways of looking at the world, it's going to be real difficult. Like, um, uh, one example I give is uh, <clears throat> a fundamentalist Christian maintaining that uh, masturbation is a sin, uh, and it's believed in the, in the Catholic faith. The one I was I was raised. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a it's a cardinal sin. Wow. It's not just any sin. And <clears throat> the reason why is because in the 1800s, with the advent of of high level microscopy, they were able to see spermatozoa. And so I think it was Pope Pius, uh, I can't remember what number, 14th, decided those little sperm are little people. They're humunculi. Uh, and therefore, you can't spill your seed on the ground. It's got one major, you know, receptacle. Mm -hmm. And that's a woman's vagina. Definitely not a man's anus. Definitely not a man's anus. And so what then... Was that? <laughs> the, I'm doing rap now. I'm doing spoken word. So if you masturbate, your spermatozoa are going where God did not intend. And so that's why it's a cardinal sin. Now you tell a 13 year old boy, you know, that not only can you not do that, but if you do, you do know that God is watching and he's pretty much got a list and he's checking off, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's a jerk off road to hell right there. If you keep doing that. <laughs> so it's like, what kind of damage are you doing to a kid's brain by telling them that to me, to Richard Dawkins, to Lawrence Krauss, to Sam Harris, that is harm. You are now, that is child abuse. Mm -hmm. You ought not to tell a child that. Yes, you have a right to believe in your religion and you have a right to practice your religion. But if your religion maintains that, it's fucked up. It's not, oh, well, you know, it could be right, it could be, no, it's wrong. Well, same thing right now. Isn't the Roman Catholic still against homosexuality? Yeah, loosening up on that. I yeah, don't, I, don't, I don't follow. No, I don't follow. No, they're not. On. No, Francis seems to be more accepting of it. But when you push him hard enough, yeah, he'll have to stick with you know the central tenets of the like the craziest the thing I heard before is like they condemned condoms. It's not just that they condemn condoms. It got so whacked that there were bishops in Africa who are saying if you used a condom, you were more likely to get AIDS. <sighs> like it's gotten way out of hand. That's insane. So I have a certain level of tolerance for religious belief. And so you, you, you know, all of ethics can, can look like this. If, if, if the, if the, you know, the Y axis is harm and the X axis is time. Mm -hmm. And we have tolerance up here, you know, a high level of tolerance for a low level of harm as we move across time, sure. then my tolerance is going to be very high. Once the harm starts to rise, the tolerance is going to dip and there's yeah. going to be an internet intersecting point at which we get to say, time out here. Yeah. No, no, no. You have a right to believe in this, but you then don't have a right for the entailments of that belief that cause harm to other people. So I think we can all agree we're cool with religion insofar as any other belief system. If you're not harming people, it's yep. really not our business, you know? But, um, and the same I would say for Islam, there, we know of cases where women are taking their young daughters to the Middle East, to Africa, to have clitorectomies. Yeah, F FGM, is it? Yeah, yeah, female genital mutilation. So how is a 14-year-old girl going to speak out against her community and say, you know what, uh, I'm going to opt out on this one? when she's pressured, you know, to follow suit, you know, and that's only one specific sect of Islam. It's not all of Islam, mm -hmm. right? So then how do we educate? How do we protect that girl? You know, and, and, and at the same time, respect a group's constitutional right to practice, you know, freedom of conscience, uh, religion, N no easy answers, but can we all agree that that is a harmful act that is highly unnecessary? You do not need to remove a woman's clitoris outside of therapeutic reasons, cancer, whatever. There's no, for religious reasons, I got to say, no, nah, no, we can't. We can't do that. And I'll, I'll respect your views, but at that point, no. I, and I think our government actually should have the duty, the obligation to speak up and say, no, you're in Canada now. I don't think we can really honor you're going to another country to have this done. She comes back. What kind of complications could there be, right? You know, some women, some girls have bled to death. Some 
I've had all kinds of uterine complications because of it, infections. That's this also brings thing. up a good debate of like circumcision too, eh? And circumcision. You let the let the kid decide when he's 18 or 16 yeah. or whatnot if he wants to, you know, take the hood off and go convertible. That's yeah. that's his call. Yeah. All right. So where were we? We're at the C. So C, yeah. So we've with lots and lots of biases. Yeah, yeah. C is for uh, uh, context, and you can't take information isolated. You know, it's always embedded in a context. Mm -hmm. and ah. The better we appreciate that context. This goes to our story of the gentleman who um, murdered his daughter 25 oh, years Robert ago. Robert Latimer. Context. I saw that as a post. Um, some young lady outraged saying, this man should go to hell and uh, this and that. And right. I clicked and I read and I was like, this is interesting. I don't know. It's not as cut and dry. Context is king, right? Like, context is king right here because... Here we have Tracy Latimer as a 13-year-old with severe, I think it was cerebral palsy, and constantly having uh, seizures, not very conscious, you know what I mean? Not a consciously aware uh, human being. And he just saw her health diminish and diminish and diminish, and she was choking a lot. And I guess he had decided in his mind that she had suffered enough, and he took it upon himself to euthanize her. Mm. The problem with that is plenty of people had been euthanized by their family members and didn't didn't serve time. Oh, really? Yeah, because the judge would see the compassionate grounds. Yeah. It's, think, it's ridiculous now to put the brother into prison for doing something when the, the deceased had written fully out, oh, I it. wish to die, my brother is going to do this for me. And so it exonerates him. Mm. Tracy couldn't voice whether she wanted to live or not. Therefore, the judge had no real option but to convict him on the, a murder the, charge. The quotes from this, uh, what is it? The uh, CBC article is interesting to, to, to hear. Uh, he says, it was pointless to torture her daughter any further. She had already got, had four operations. If she moved, her hip would go. She had rods in her back. She had been worked on enough. And it goes on. Basically, to him, it was just one science experiment after another. They wouldn't let the daughter pass away. And she was just in miserable in pain. And not, you know, an itch, but severe pain. Constantly, yeah. It was not a good state to be in. So they convicted him of murder? Yes. And he yeah. served his time, and then he got out. And it was a murder later. Later. It, would it wouldn't be murder one. I don't know what he got. It would be two or mur or manslaughter. Yeah, because euthanasia is legal. Well, that was at a time when it wasn't. Oh, this is an old case. Oh, this is old school. This uh, is going back ten, yeah, or yeah. fifteen okay. years. Okay. And don't forget what else was happening in the states. He was convicted at that time. twenty-five years ago. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jack Kevorkian, do you remember him? Oh yeah. So Doctor Death, they called him in mm, the states. Mm -hmm. He had a machine called the uh, what do you call it? The the Thanatos machine, which Greek for death. And it was the same three chemicals that are used in, um, you know, federal penitentiaries when the death sentence. Yeah. So the first thing is a kind of a, a narcotic to kind of, you know, mellow you out and whatnot. The second is a major muscle relaxant mm -hmm. because when they put the toxin in, your body will naturally fight Seize, that. Yeah. And then the third one is the toxin. And uh, Kevorkian's machine worked very well. Here's something you don't know. But one of the guys you let you met at the last talk I gave yeah. was a founding member of an underground organization that helped people die. Oh, wow. Before That's a crazy story. Dr. Richard Thane. Oh, really? And Richard. him along with John Hostess, you can, look, you can look this up or you can post a link mm -hmm. to this guy. It's funny. You see, uh, you meet a guy, such a sweetheart. Yeah. You just want to hug him. Well, they, they, <laughs> they helped rather notable people die. Yeah. Uh, like Canadian poets and people like that, uh, fairly famous people. But it was never written, you know, the cause of death was just they died in their sleep or whatever. But no, Interesting. It, was, it was this John Haas, this guy. He was helping them do it. I think he helped end eight lives. And then when he himself wanted to die, it was months before MAID or medical assistance in dying was legal in Canada. He had to go to Switzerland to have it done. Uh. And Richard Thane went with him. Interesting. Yeah. And death is probably the most serious decision any person is going to have to make. And if you can do it consciously, great. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of a bonus. It's the ones who can't. Yes. 
So yep. in our wills, my wife's and my will, we have what's called an advanced directive. And the advanced directive is to our sons who will be the powers of attorney. Yeah, I just did that with my mom. Oh, okay. She said, if I ever become a potato. Yeah. So you give the kids, you know, you say, you know, check it out. You're bright people. You, you'll know if we're having a good time or not. Yeah. And uh, make the call because. Especially I, the age too. Like if you're yeah. 80, become a potato. That's and you the thing. A good life, it's like, or you develop early onset, you know, with yeah. dementia, that kind of thing. And you can't fully do that. That's the issue. We might as well jump into this right now yeah. before we get to the D and Fs. If we're talking about medical assistance and dying, when I was asked to put in my two cents about the development of it, and then they went ahead and it came back to us, a lot of bioethicists said, this doesn't account for anybody with psych psychiatric conditions or future conditions. It says six months imminent death. You got to be within that kind of window for the board to say, okay, we'll, mm. we'll, we'll grant it. And then there's two ways in which you can take yourself out, have a doctor administer it, or they just give you the prescription and you get the script filled and you do it yourself. Oh, wow. So there's two ways huh. you can do like it. Right? Socrates. A lot of doctors. Yeah. dress in the, the hemlock. robe and everything. Yeah. I want a photo like that. <laughs> my finger, a few yeah, people, yeah. a few of my interns crying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the hemlock milkshake. Yeah. Right. So the, the problem is, is that doctors really don't want to do this. We're finding out. Sure. Yeah. They're not thrilled about doing this. They will. Yeah. Yeah. But that's huge on them, you know, killing somebody. I What'd you do today, you. honey? Oh, I killed a few people. And so I think there should be like nurse practitioners, people who are okay with doing this, mm. who are especially trained yeah. to do this kind of work. We should talk to vets to put down animals, how they feel too. Oh, I cried more Ouch. putting down a rat yeah. than I did watching both of my parents die. Interesting. Because the rat... Its life, its quality of life was coming to an end. It had a tumor. It was having seizures. It wasn't having a good time. And then you have to make that decision for it. But on the way to the vet, when it's looking at you, like it's just yeah. another day, yeah. and you know it's going to die, that's tough. Yeah. And mm. now that I have a dog, it's going to be even worse because it's a far more sentient being, right? Yeah. So that's going to be really tough. When a person knows they're on their way out, euthanasia literally means in Greek, good death. Oh, it does? Yeah. Oh, cool. So you literally uh, want to have a good death. We want a good life. What did you think of Robin Williams? Apparently, he was diagnosed with something, right? Oh, he had a, he he had a he severe a form of Parkinson's, though. did he? Yeah. 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 So if he didn't do... I, the way I look at it, if he didn't do it himself then, when he had the faculty and the ability, right. he may not have been able to do it later. Well, that's our beef, is when you have early onset dementia... How do you know where that six month window is? It's unfair. Mm -hmm. And how cruel is it to know you're losing your capacity for conscious awareness? Yeah. For an intelligent person, what what cr more cruel fate could, could await a yeah. person than to gradually realize, you know, and have their spouses say, you've asked me that. You've asked me that 26 times in a row. Have I? Have I? You can't even there feel bad like, about there it. There should be like know? a checklist. Like, have we tried this? protocol this right. protocol this until you exhausted everything yeah then it's like yeah but then again i've seen people in various stages of dementia and alzheimer's and even when they've lost their capacity to recognize anybody again they seem to be having an okay time yeah. like they're not in any pain they're not in any distress yeah. so you play video games you can do all kinds of stuff but how do we know what their video game console there's interesting <laughs> new studies pizza. on transcranial stimulation now coming up like really? really really promising research using different frequency dc current um okay yeah, really really interesting studies. one of my buddies was a pioneer in that a guy named michael persinger okay. he, he was up in uh sudbury and he did the electromagnetic mm -hmm. stuff and uh yeah i mean people who believe in the sanctity of life and that you shouldn't treat people you know, as they believe as objects, as a means to an end, to put them out of their misery, so to speak, whether they're religious minded or not, believe that it's life's hardships that push us to become better people. And that's why God wants us to do it. Okay. I get that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your belief and that's how you see things. And that's fine. The problem with that though is, <clears throat> A, we don't know if any such God exists. And B, we don't really know what's going on in the faculties and the level of reasoning of that person when they're in that state. So who's going to make that call? And at what point do we say their life is no longer worth living from my perspective yeah. as a person speaking on their behalf? 
Yeah. That's a tough call. And it's, I'm not saying it's going to get easier. I think it's going to get more complicated. I have my buddy Yuri on here that specializes in longevity, uh, Yamanaka factors. Uh, and so like hypothetically, let's say where research is heading, we statistically speaking, will have the ability to extend life yeah. for a very long time. Well, with telomeric sciences and that's, knowing. That's exactly it. Yeah. So let's say hypothetically yeah. within the next 50 years, we'll see the first 100 in. 150 year old person yeah, through this through this uh that would method. be the next milestone for sure then the question comes like let's say we for time like you look at progress that we've made in the last 100 years i can't even imagine we're going to be in the next 100 years mm -hmm. yeah and so we fast forward 100 <clears throat> years from now and let's say we have the ability for you to live till 300 mm. at what point do people say well i've lived my life here well i'm kind of tired my uh i don't know <laughs> my buddy jim shay and i are like we're sticking around yeah. as long, at least that's how we feel right if now. If I can learn yeah, keep and learning. contribute, those yeah. are the two things. As long as I can continue to learn new things and I can continue to contribute one way or another, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. The moment I feel that I can't contribute and I can't learn, I want to be off. And I've told my wife that. Mm -hmm. But it'll come in a combination of ways, right? It'll be regenerative science, figuring out how we can just make better organs, better muscles, better that kind yeah. of thing. And it'll be the transhumanism, right? Let's get the artificial parts in there of the ones that are wearing out, right? Replace them with far better materials than grow them. Or well, we can, Aubrey de Grey, we can genetically- that, That's uh, his strategy. He thinks so we're more of a, of a car. So he's like, how do you grow the mitochondria? How do you grow yeah. the, you know, ribosomes? Mm -hmm. How do you grow? How do you grow every- Grow part, a hip, grow an arm. Everything. Grow Down to everything. the cellular mechanism. Yeah. And grow it better. And like grow just, it better, yeah. You know, well, yeah. we can grow skin now. We're doing skin graphing with uh, growing skin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, brave new world. Hopefully, you know, the, the biggest irony of my life is that they'll figure out how to do this, you know, a week after I'm dead. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think living longer is our problem. Yeah. I think we need to figure out how to live better before we learn to live longer, oh, yeah. which is actually the main point of our conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> going back to abcs yeah do you want me to get back yes what's let's d finish, yeah, let's so, finish it off. so d is connected to a yeah it's how we can diagram our arguments so or somebody else's argument whether it's spoken written whatever and it allows us to visually then see what the house looks like and all the component parts so we know what the conclusion is that's whatever the person happens to believe you know uh, euthanasia is good, euthanasia is bad, whatever. Abortion is good, abortion is bad. That's their conclusion. But then we can see what all of their reasons are and how those reasons relate to that, that conclusion. And we can do it for our own thinking mm -hmm. as well, right? We can write down what it is we think and why it is we think that so we have a better understanding. So diagramming is like a, I call it the most boring part of the critical thinking skills, but it is so essential because it allows us to literally see what an argument looks like on paper, you know, visually get a good, a good grasp of it so that we can then say it back to the other person if it's not our argument and then critique it much more fairly because we can literally say, is this what you mean? Yeah. Right. And they can see it and they go, yep. Yeah. Or if they disagree, we can then revise it and then begin. Yeah. E then is evidence. So many claims required and there's different types of evidence. So you got to be careful which type of evidence is best for this particular type of topic. And F just involves all of the different types of fallacies that can be committed or errors in reasoning. So I mentioned Trump uses lots of ad hominems, you know, literally Latin for against the man or against the person. Uh, usually that means you've lost the argument. You start criticizing personal characteristics yeah. about a person, you've lost. Because you're no longer addressing what they're saying. No, it's like the Persian saying, don't kill the messenger. Yeah. So you're dealing <laughs> with a relevant... Conservatives did with uh, Jean Chrétien's with face. With Chrétien. Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Conservatives in 93 did that. You that know, didn't go well. It's any anytime you demean a... Racism is just a big ad hominem. You're mm. just, you're demeaning another person for irrelevant characteristics that have nothing to do with the issue at hand. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the, the six, you know, argument, bias, context, diagram, evidence, and fallacies. Those are the basic tools within the overall critical thinking skill set if people learn what those are about and how to utilize them better and it's like a language though it's not it's not a quick fix it's not something you can learn just overnight and apply it's going to take a little bit of time sure but at least there's like a heuristic there is yeah, yeah. there is and 
by having it with the first six letters of the the English alphabet, it, it's a very handy mnemonic. Really, just if you can remember A to F and yeah. what all those are, then you can remember how then to apply them. And you know what I mean? It, the mnemonic just trails down like a like a tree, and then basically it'll increase the likelihood for us to at least understand the differences between arguments that people might have so that we can better uh, position ourselves to appreciate how have we been biased to believe what we now 